I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Eric Simonson, Managing Partner, ensures that the firm's portfolio of research capabilities comprehensively addresses the entire global service space across geographies, services, and sourcing models. Anurag Srivastava, Vice President, assists clients on topics related to location optimization, benchmarking, and global service delivery strategy. And Purul Jain, Practice Director, front ends the firm's thought leadership on next generation themes for GBS organizations, such as the impact of digitalization and automation on delivery portfolio strategies. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Eric. Take it away, Eric. Great, thanks. Um, excited to uh, be with everyone today and think we have a, a great webinar um, uh, planned for everyone. Um, obviously, a lot has changed in the last couple months around work and the context of work, uh, which raises the question of how will workforces be be influenced by everything we're learning and the, the disruptions. Uh, that's what we'll be diving into today. Um, we'll start this um, with uh, providing an introduction and some context setting uh, that I'll take us through. I'll then hand it to Anurag and Parul to uh, talk about some of the uh, convictions, provocations, and controversies that we um, uh, see around workforce. Uh, and then we'll wrap up at the end with a few minutes for Q&A. Um, so please feel free to be submitting those in the right hand uh, panel. Uh, some of them we'll try to answer as we go along. Others will uh, uh, be covered at the, uh, the end of the document. Um, I wanna make a couple quick um, contextual points before we dive in. Um, the first is that we're taking a very broad uh, view of the definition of workforce. It's not just the uh, having the right number of people with the right skills. Um, it's into how work occurs, how that's configured, um, the sourcing models, internal, external. So it's a very integrated and holistic view of what is work. Um, the second thing is we've realized that we are gonna be talking about work a lot. And we got some coaching that we need to actually have some fun. So we've um, uh, cleverly integrated uh, three polls into today's webinar. And the first one, we're gonna try to have a lot of fun. So if we could go to the poll. All right, so our first poll um, is, uh, just to get everybody warmed up, is which of the following best represents your ideal office for work? Would you prefer to work in the Office US version, Dundler Miffin, the Office UK version, office space, um, famous for the, the red stapler, or uh, friends in Central Perk, uh, the virtual work location for some of that crew. We'll let this go for a few moments and give you a chance to answer that. For those of you who aren't familiar with office space, which is probably the, the least known of these, would uh, encourage you to get a chance to watch it at, at some point. Um, it's a fun one um, and a very uh, cynical take on work. All right. Okay, so looking at the results now, um, we see um, over 40% actually choosing friends. Um, interestingly, a bit more choosing um, uh, office space than I would have guessed. I would have guessed that uh, the office US or UK would have broken it. Um, but 43% on friends, 26 on office space, um, then 23% on the U.S. office, followed by um, eventually 8% on the, the U.K. office. Um, so um, in all seriousness, I think what we have here is um, a little bit reflective of what do we mean by work and uh, in some ways a uh, workforce, which is it's not just actually about the work. What we actually see reflecting in this is the culture, the feeling of belonging, and hence why something like Friends comes to the forefront of what type of place we'd like to work in. Um, it's uh, as much about the, I'm sorry, although the transactions that we complete are important, the um, context around that and the, the learning and the sharing is uh, much more important. Next slide, please. Over the past um, uh, um, six weeks or so, we've been tracking how the industry is emerging through a series of stages. Um, we very quickly went through stage one, uh, which is basically getting a lot of the knowledge work into a work from home model, um, followed shortly after that by stage two of ensuring that uh, that model is being productive, um, that uh, if uh, people are gonna be um, 
where people may be uh, fully available, where there are gonna be challenges with medical absenteeism, et cetera. By and large, the industry made it through these stages uh, very well. Um, I'd say that not because there weren't problems, there clearly were challenges and um, problems, but the um, within just a few weeks, um, many organizations on a global basis had moved a tremendous amount of work into these into these uh, this new model. And I think um, everybody that I've spoken to is impressed of what was actually able to happen. Um, so uh, we've largely transitioned uh, through these and um, they're now into uh, looking forward. Most organizations have now entered into the, um, uh, the uh, looking at cost takeout um, and almost all are also starting to think about how might they uh, reset to the next normal what is the new things that they need to be able to do in the future um, the rest of today's webinar will largely focus around um, some of the uh, cost items and how workforce uh, can contribute into that we'll also be hinting at some things that are about the new normal as well on slide six um, when you're thinking about um, cost takeout, um, there are several different levers um, that, uh, that come to mind. And at the highest level, there's three. The first is um, how are you sourcing the work? And this is, in effect, who is doing the work, whether that be um, outsourced um, internally, whether that be onshore, offshore, et cetera. It's the kind of the who of getting work done. Um, the two major areas that people tend to think about are how do you place the work? Um, and what parts of the location, how do you maybe split processes, and how that, how that maps into the geographies. Uh, the second is potential third party. Um, how do you optimize what's going on with the third parties and their, um, their contribution to the work? The second major lever is around the talent portfolio optimization. And whereas the first was around who, this is around configuring the who and how work gets done. Um, so this could be uh, things like the skills um, re specifically required, the mix of that, the pyramids, the ratios of that can also be like configuring how work from home contributes to this. Um, we'll be covering work from home more um, uh, throughout the, the webinar and it's you know, clearly an area where there will be a lot of questions, um, but, the, but these are not the only ways uh, to configure the uh, talent portfolio. The third lever is the process optimization. So if the first two were kind of about the who and how to configure the who, this is about the what. What are the who's doing um, and how are they getting that done? Um, two two uh, kind of sub levers within this. One, the automation and process um, uh, portions of it. Uh, this is pretty well known, but takes on a lot of extra meaning here as uh, openness to change has increased. We also start to become more concerned with productivity and uh, how to ensure that the model continues to work, you get the quality, you get the throughput, I and mean, things don't become wobbly or uh, a diminished uh, effectiveness as, um, as things progress. As we then look uh, forward and uh, turn to slide seven, um, the way we would summarize how all this needs to fit together, in some ways the, more, the most strategic view of what you're really looking to solve for is the overall workforce strategy. And, uh, we believe it's important to take a holistic view um, and to consider all of these things, um, even if the problem that you're thinking about addressing is, is in one area, you need to think about the implications in other areas. Uh, this, this framework has three major parts. Uh, the first uh, is the talent strategy, and this is in effect, how do you plan the population? So what sort of supply and demand do you need? Um, what's the sourcing model? Um, how is that located physically? And then um, what are the skills required and how those skills relate to each other, the skills taxonomy. So all of these overlap with each other and it's important to solve them um, simultaneously um, because the answer to one um, will impact uh, the others as well. The second major component is the people strategy, which is integrating the individual into that model, making them um, effective and uh, productive. Uh, this goes all the way from making sure you get the right people and enough of them to uh, bringing them on board, making them effective, developing them, integrated, to uh, retaining them with a good employee value proposition, ongoing career and development. Both of these two components are reasonably traditional views of workforce. The third and what we think is um, um, often left out historically, but um, um, uh, certainly should not be going forward is how do you actually optimize the work itself? 
This could be through technology, could be through the use of analytics, uh, or things like uh, productivity and continuous improvement. What we mean by optimizing the work is how can you potentially change the work to enable solving the challenges in the other areas to become easier? Let me give an example. Uh, you may use technology to potentially de-skill some of the work so that it's easier to recruit and um, operate against a certain type of work. Uh, this could be uh, something that maybe provides automatic suggestions of what could be happening, uh, may help on uh, checking for errors, et cetera, and you in some ways take some of the art out of the work and make it um, easier for a larger population to do. Um, similarly, maybe in analytics, you could use analytics to more um, uh, actively distribute work to the right people who have the right expertise, um, the volumes, et cetera, uh, so that uh, you're getting the right quality and throughput of things as it's occurring. Uh, this could be across sourcing models, um, a whole bunch of ways you could smartly deal with how you optimize the work to be done and how well it's being done. So these are um, uh, it's kind of the top top line of what we're what we're um, thinking in terms of total talent um, workforce. Um, we will focus the rest of the webinar really on the talent strategy and uh, how these tie into the, the workforce. It's the design of what you're trying to do and uh, critically important to getting things right. And with that, I'll hand it to Anurag uh, to uh, take us into the next section. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so as Eric mentioned, the next section is about our key convictions, provocations and controversies for how we see the future of workforce strategy. Uh, we'll jump into that in a while, but before that we have a, a poll coming up for you. So the, the question is, what is your perception of the impact of work from home on current productivity in your organization? So in the current lockdown phase, most organizations have had to move into a remote working model. As you have done that, what is your perception of the of of the impact on productivity in your organization has it decreased significantly uh, decreased in a, on a limited basis has there been no change at all or has there been a limited or significant increase we'll give you a few seconds to answer uh, as we wait for the results i'd also want to point out that we are looking at this topic in more detail we are actually planning to publish a enterprise playbook on how they should be tackling the work from home question goes into a lot of implications around security impact on real estate demand how should performance management change uh, and how what is the impact on employee engagement and other factors so be be on the lookout for that um, let's have a few more seconds to close this okay so we have the results here uh, there has been practically there's more concentration around the middle of the panel here so there's been either a limited decrease a no change or limited increase which goes in line with what we're hearing from the market in most places um, from our conversations with gbs and service providers uh, this is you know, consistent with that. We've also seen some examples where there's been lower absenteeism and lesser HR-related grievances. So, so interesting result, but not entirely un, uh, unexpected. Thank you. Okay. So, so before we jump into uh, the actual convictions, uh, I wanted to set out what we mean by convictions, provocations, and controversies, right? So uh, convictions are essentially foundational or solid beliefs. These are um, trends that we have solid evidence and facts to back up. These may not be all surprising to you, uh, and these may be collected in conversation with some of you, um, but we may have uncovered some new data or some color that may be interesting for you to look at. So we have four of these as we walk along. Uh, then we get into some provocations. So these are not quite as solidly backed up by facts, uh, but these are more emerging trends or direction where the market may be heading. Uh, these may offer some value creation ideas to you or challenge the way you've been thinking about some of these trends. So these may be quite interesting for you to listen to as well. And then finally, we have three controversies. Um, 
as the name suggests, these are emerging hypotheses on some of these trends. These are things that we are continuing to investigate. We see that uh, people are wondering about or people are asking us, ab asking us about. So this is how we want to break up our perspectives on the future of workforce strategy. With that, let me jump into the actual convictions on page 11. Yes, so um, essentially starting out, you know, what we saw was due to the unprecedented nature of the disruption caused by COVID-19, right? In the sense that uh, there's a massive scale of disruption plus the kind of elements that got impacted, which is uh, people, but also ability to work from a location because of the shelter in place and lockdown measures. What we, what we saw is that uh, all delivery locations were impacted, which was practically uh, no one had planned for. Uh, but what we also saw was that after a few initial teething problems, most organizations actually were able to figure out remote delivery. Right? So that, that's the first message. Uh, the second one is about um, the disruption caused by this crisis was felt across both service delivery models. So whether it be uh, GBS centers, hybrid models uh, or third party models. There was a lack of resilience in all kinds of models um, because of the unprecedented scenario of global downtime. No BCP plans uh, sort of were prepared for this, uh, but there were differences in how this played out across uh, across the across the market. And there are some learnings around that. Right? Overall, what we saw, which is the third conviction, is that the GBS organizations were uh, slightly better position to the disruption uh, and they showed more resilience they adapted better to the initial disruption and we have some perspectives on what that means as as we go forward and look into coming out of the crisis right and then finally what we'll touch upon is um, as um, as this crisis causes more fundamental long-term transformation which is essentially also looking at sort of a post vaccine period, maybe you know, 18 months and beyond. Uh, we see uh, many changes in, in, in the industry in terms of service delivery models or working models. Uh, we picked three for discussion today. Uh, these three are, one is the first one is remote delivery models. So this is work from home essentially. There are digitally augmented um, working models. So this could be intelligent voice agents or chatbots or self service, service models. And the third one we, we picked was flexible delivery. So this could be things like tapping into contingent labor or gig or cloud or crowd kind of workforce. However, we'll also touch upon some of these, um, some of the challenges and limitations that all of these service delivery models come with. Uh, so more details when we talk about, uh, talk about this one in more detail. Uh, I'll hand it over to Parul from here to talk about the first couple of convictions. Parul? Thanks. Thank you, Anurag. Uh, moving to slide 12, right? Here we look at the volume and impact of COVID on key global services delivery locations. What we've done is we've compiled the data that we track on a regular basis, things around size of the global services market, which is represented on the X axis. On the Y axis, we have the acceleration rate, which is the average growth in new COVID cases per week. And we've taken a trailing three week average to kind of portray a more stable picture. Essentially, what we see here are some clusters and a couple of locations showing independent traits. Uh, talking about India first, India has now crossed the 100K mark and the fourth lockdown is currently in play. There is uncertainty around when companies will be fully able to resume their in office operations, though large percentage of the workforce is in provisional work from home mode. With the acceleration slowing down in Philippines, the location has also been able to improve their productivity or our kind of uh, remote working percentage that, that they're in the location. Clusters we see on the left, they represent locations which are smaller in size uh, when it comes to global services delivery and are at varying degrees of recovery. So the cluster on top left, which mainly comprises of locations in Latin America, Caribbean and Africa, uh, the rate of infection here is kind of increased and with relatively lower proportion of market in the work from home mode. Now, Brazil has now surpassed uh, Britain, Spain, Italy in the past 72 hours on the list of total infections and is only behind US and Russia. 
what is concerning is that for these cluster of location for this cluster right uh, where the growth rate is accelerating there is lesser readiness to deal with the disruption from an infrastructure standpoint so so you see these locations marked with a yellow dot here they do not have the most favorable environment last mile connectivity or or tech readiness issues uh so so basically global service delivery practitioners who kind of have a skew towards these location might need to think of more more consciously think about their bcp or or backup options now the bottom cluster has a mix of near shore european locations central eastern european locations and a few asian ones like singapore and malaysia this cluster has favorable infrastructure and is now on the path to kind of resume operations uh we advise practitioners who can use this chart to identify areas where growth is where growth in cases is expected to increase where where in locations are kind of more equipped to deal with the scenario so so essentially locations in central eastern europe might normalize sooner if you have delivery footprint in a higher footprint in latin america you might need to stay cautious uh we're also tracking these locations regularly and you can refer uh, to our covid-19 resource center on our website uh moving on and if you were to kind of deep dive on what were the key enablers which is on page 13 uh you know that drove the readiness of these locations here's how the picture turns out for most developed locations such as the us uk uh infrastructure readiness coupled with the nature of work that these locations were serving more analytical amenable to remote delivery all of these factors helped in quicker transition there have been multiple instances of companies deploying remote work once a week model hence faster adoption in in costa rica we heard some concerns around the cost of retail broadband which presented teething concerns when companies were moving to remote working model uh the central eastern european majors check and polish locations uh they showed one of the uh, high levels of home working from home flexibility with about 70 to 80% of the companies switching to remote delivery uh for india and philippines uh the government gradually announced global services as an essential business and companies comply to the regulations while in india we currently see about 80 to 90% of the workforce active in the remote model for philippines this number hovers around 60% with another kind of 10 15% delivering work as part of the skeleton staff which is housed on site or in nearby hotels and in these numbers were, were these figures were only at say 40 or a couple of weeks back so what is particularly interesting to note especially for india and philippines the offshore location uh, offshore giants is a change in perception how how these locations could gear up and transition to a remote model uh now while the analysis is by and large true for all locations there were some companies who were able to transition faster than others driven by better workforce practices they had say more uh, personal devices in play more testing of bcp so on and so forth this leads to our next conviction which is around how covid exposed the fragility in enterprise uh, bcp models with that we'll move on to slide 14 Now here we have an interesting piece of analysis what we did is looked at a sample set of about 1600 enterprises and the extent of diversification of their global business services gbs footprint more than 70% of the enterprises what you see on the top chart here had all their eggs in one basket as in operated a single location strategy now if we were to dissect the data and analyze enterprises with multi location portfolios majority of them either had concentration of headcount in one center or had significant uh, high concentration of headcount for one particular function in a location so thereby leaving limited scope for resiliency redundancy uh what we've seen is based on our interactions uh, in the market you know it, it is a common perception that operating a delivery portfolio from multiple location kind of guarantees bcp success however a portfolio of locations specifically multiple locations should be viewed as an enabler to drive bcp not bcp itself now how the work is organized across the portfolio actually managed kind of determines how successful the bcp capabilities would be uh, we advise organizations to kind of assess relevance resiliency at a process or a function level 
uh, to, instead of taking a one-time blanket approach. Uh, interestingly, what we're also noticing is that many of the companies are orchestrating towards a design principle approach to, uh, to kind of carve out their workforce strategies. So essentially being more cautious about how to look at demand, supply, keep BCP as a prime factor, and then gear up for the future. Anurag, a question to you here. You've been interacting with both GBS side of the business and service providers. How does the picture look for them? Yeah, so Parul, I think uh, on the service provider side, there were different uh, levels of experiences, right? So if you look at the larger ones, some of the more global providers have a bigger global footprint. In, in most cases, these are bigger footprints than most GBS organizations as well. And because of that, they are practically also in many cases leveraged for BCP, additional BCP for enterprises. So they didn't suffer this that much. I think there were some teething issues in the beginning, but they were relatively better off uh, compared to most GBS organizations. Uh, if you look at the smaller, medium-sized service providers, especially ones that are headquartered and also concentrated in particular regions, they were ha harder hit. Uh, and in many ways, they have been exposed by this crisis for not having enough redundancy and resilience in the portfolio, right? And that's prompting some organizations to actually start considering con consolidation to the larger providers. So that that is a you know sort of a warning bell. Uh, overall, I think, like you said, even for the service provider side, while having more locations is is good, but more importantly, uh, what helps your business continuity is actually how intentional you are about work placement. So that applies to service providers as well. You need to, the need to be intentional about how you place work to create uh, overlaps and uh, and you know lack of concentration at a function and process level. Okay, um, I think the next couple of convictions are on my plate. So let's move to page 15. Uh, this is where we compare how GBS organizations, um, adapt, you know, uh, uh, compared to service providers in terms of adapting to the disruption, but also what is the implication going forward. If you look at the first column, which is in, in orange, uh, which is sort of a near term uh, impact on how these organizations compared in terms of shifting to the remote delivery model, what we observed um, as well as, you know, learned from many conversations in the market was that the GBS model was slightly better suited. Again, just for the benefit of the audience, what we're comparing here is not uh, empirical data, but more comparing the favorability of the sourcing model, as you can see from the legend, uh, not accounting for firm specific differences, but more uh, in general, how does the GBS model position uh, organizations to, uh, to, to enable some of these um, you know, uh, parameters that are on the columns. So if you look at the shifting to remote delivery itself, uh, there were some reasons why GBS organizations fared better. Uh, in many cases, this was around higher tech readiness, so more leverage of laptops and, and such devices. Uh, they were better prepared uh, with VPN and VDI kind of access. Uh, they were they also had to deal lesser to a lesser extent with contractual obligations and seek less approvals because this was more internal organizations. Uh, in many cases, uh, GBS organizations were perceived to be better pla planned, planning around BCP. Uh, so they were more intentional about work placement. They had tested their BCP better. They had started implementing some form of remote working even before uh, government regulations came in various markets respectively, right? And also finally, I think what we also see is um, they had made more sustained investments for a longer term in developing human capital and in, in a remote collaborative environment. So they had more global collaboration training, more cross training uh, in place, right? Um, at the same time, uh, you know, while this is true for the overall model, we saw that there are differences by process uh, in a previous page. So there was different experiences based on what is the process mix by market. Um, as I said earlier, there are some implications because of this. Uh, one is that m many companies we speak to are considering more in sourcing because GBS has performed better in this phase. Uh, some are actually, uh, because of the differential experience across service providers base, they are considering some consolidation or rebalancing in their portfolios. Right? Again, this is, a, this is an emerging view based on possibly about 100 conversations, 100 or so conversations. We will keep refining this further as we go along. 
uh, if you look at the next one, which is maintaining pre-COVID-19 productivity and quality, um, Peter, last page, please. Page 15, yeah. Uh, within this, we are saying that um, the service providers are, were actually better, uh, essentially because they are better at measuring productivity, throughput, they have more stringent controls and tracking in, in play, um, and they, they, they are in many cases better at maintaining uh, more complicated toolboxes. So they have a much richer repertoire. They are uh, they have made more investments into this, right? And then finally, if you look at the last column, which is enabling longer term transformation, we believe that because of the deep disruption this crisis will cause, as well as the need to essentially re envision operating models, plus the need to retain more agility and control over things like workforce, uh, talent, uh, you know, delivery models. We believe that GBS organizations will be better placed. Um, essentially, if you drill down into this from a design perspective, GBS organizations will have more proximity, access to an influence over design programs because of being internal. But at the same time, uh, service providers may have an edge in terms of executing this because they are better suited to acting as change agents. Uh, they have, have experience in industrializing workforce as well as can be leveraged on a selective basis to fill talent caps and BCP caps. I think the net message also is that the key driver in all of this and different experiences and different pace of adapt adaptation is about nature of work. So it may be very different when you talk about whether it was a contact center that we're talking about or an IT or a legal help desk. So it's more about the investments you make and the competencies you build rather than purely about the model you're operating. Next page, please. Uh, with that, we come to the final uh, conviction we wanted to cover essentially a fundamental uh, impact on delivery models or working models. Uh, as we said, we are covering three here. Uh, the first one I wanted to pick up was the remote delivery model, uh, including work at home or freelancers. Um, there's been a lot of news around this. Uh, I think most of you would be aware of the major tech giants, TCS committing say committing 75% of workforce being uh, in a work from home mode by 2025. JPMC came out with something uh, a couple of days back. So there's a lot of opportunities around this which are at play. Um, essentially, uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, there's uh, uh, an angle about avoiding costs. Uh, there's also this uh, upside of being able to tap into talent that you would probably not be able to otherwise, right? And it adds to your BCP, um, BCP levers as well. However, there are significant limiting factors around technology. So last mile connectivity, bandwidth, infrastructure issues. Uh, there are concerns around data security, some of which were, um, you know, um, companies were, were sort of shying away from uh, being very stringent about in the current crisis, but these will matter in the longer run, uh, as well as I think the one impact that we have not seen so far, which is the impact of limited social interaction on employee motivation, employee engagement, and possible loss of culture uh, or lack of a common integrated culture as a firm. If you look at the second one, which is the digitally augmented delivery, um, there's been, uh, you know, lots of research has pointed to the fact that millennials, millennials actually prefer to deal with digital uh, models and self-service models than having to interact with people. Uh, so that need to reduce human touch uh, goes in line with enterprises' um, goals of reducing dependence on human workforce. Uh, overall, it also in many ways improves efficiency, effectiveness, and also um, customer convenience as it, it you know, results in many more uh, ways of being able to work with your service provider than, than earlier. But there are again limitations to this uh, around the extent of how much you can automate. There's some investment involved in, um, in, in, in sort of creating these tools as well as possible loss of process knowledge once you've automated or you know, digit, digit, digitalized something. And finally, on the flexible staffing model, the contingent side, uh, we see that there's been big moves around this already. So uh, this is not uh, as big a uh, transformational kind of a lever, uh, but as talent becomes more and more, talent needs become more niche and possibly more congestion in some areas of the market, we see contingent becoming quite important. Um, it offers flexibility, it, it, offers, it offers enhanced BCP, but there are some concerns around data security, knowledge leakage, but also you know, impact on employee engagement and culture. 
overall we believe that uh, based on some surveys we ran, ran uh, up to 75 percent of enterprises are actually putting significant effort into de you know creating flexibility across these models uh, i think a couple of things that are driving these overall one very importantly um, you know increasing comfort with digital offerings at the customer end in many cases actually customers asking for and desiring more more uh, digital uh, plus um, you know as an in the in the talent market as well uh, companies that are leveraging some of these uh, taking away monotonous work through automation or offering remote working models are actually perceived as better employers so these are also pushing adoption of these alternative working models um, Eric question to you you have uh, possibly interacted with a lot of enterprises around this work from home topic and it is top of mind for most people there's a lot of uncertainty in the market around extent and implications of implementing this model how do you see this uh, model playing out yeah so i'll, I'll keep it i'll keep it short because i think it's um it's a fairly complex topic the, the things that come to mind are first work from home um, is actually really a, a spectrum of potential models all the way from you know almost entirely or entirely work from home to primarily to occasionally to you know on an exception basis and how you align that to the nature of the work and the roles i think will be with people or um will be uh, sorting through over the coming coming uh, quarters um the second thing i'd say that um we don't really list here but is a, a major point of consideration is uh, the development of employees and how how that um, uh, maybe need, may need to be different in um, those working from home. That also um, influences where you may position things on the spectrum uh, that I just described. I think those are the, the two of the things that are um, uh, the more strategic concerns and um, the design of how to actually take the concept and turn it into something that's real. Thanks, Eric. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Parul to run through the rest of the provocations. Thanks, Anurag. Uh, starting with the first provocation here, uh, coming out of COVID, right? We believe there is going to be a growing appetite for for a frantic digital transformation, automation, and modernization, if you will. Uh, improving operational efficiency, we believe, is you know key at the moment, uh, due to the entire epidemic availability of workforce across businesses is severely constrained. So. Automation here seems more like a viable answer to deal with the situation. Now, uh, we, the need to save costs will be part of the emphasis, but organizations are going to realize that, you know, hey, there have been opportunities around automation we've already been thinking about. Now is the time. Now we do realize how valuable they can be in, in, in a, if such a situation were to kind of repeat, God for say. Now, we're seeing multiple examples of organizations, their GBS arms stepping up and using the pause productively. So examples of companies partnering with the ecosystem to, to accelerate their time to market, develop best of breed solutions. A uh, few examples in the BFSI vertical, in the retail vertical uh, and tech specifically, where, where they're leveraging IoT, data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence based solutions to kind of gain real-time granular actionable insights into the health of their business processes, critical assets, infrastructure, and customer-facing operations. Uh, for the, what we're essentially saying is that the approach that enterprises take, that it shouldn't, shouldn't be myopic, as in focused on just getting past the existing crisis. It should rather be broad, serving as a stepping stone to kind of continuously test the resilience and uh, kind of evaluating the potential of emerging technologies to, to, to have quick wins in this changing business landscape. Now, now moving on to the second provocation here, uh, page 20. Uh, what we see here is, as, as enterprise have ensured operational continuity and solved for tactic, uh, tactical teething issues, we believe going forward, there will be a strong need to recalibrate their future growth plans, how demand looks like, uh, what do we need to plan for, how should we go about it, especially considering the factors that have disrupted the market in an unprecedented fashion. Now, stabilizing the demand plan is a critical part of, of a strong recovery and, and of a future success. Uh, based on our interactions with market leaders, we understand there are six essential factors at play 
which kind of impact demand projections. There are a few traditional levers, such as uh, desired shoring mix, sourcing mix, which include aspects around how close do we want to stay to the customers? What does the likely outsourced versus in-house mix look like? Uh, and an important lever which has been underplayed in, in most enterprises planning is PCP. Now, uh, so, so thinking about how do I create a flexible work, uh, workforce strategy to build resiliency? How can I look at remote delivery as a BCP lever? And so on and so forth. Uh, the next parameter is, is skills. Uh, so things around, uh, you know, what kind of skill mix do I require? Are there any gap, uh, gaps for, say, the emerging skills which I need to be cautious of? Do I need to plan for them? Uh, the next piece, which we've already touched upon, is the impact of technology and how it influences demand. So, so things around uh, impact of self-serve, as Anurag talked about, impact of agile, DevSecOps, etc. Now, these are all sort of drivers of demand or considerations for companies as they forecasted demand. There is, uh, with COVID scenario, there's a need to kind of uh, reforecasting. So, uh, essentially, the parameters highlighted in orange box they they kind of become more important, more heightened, right? Uh, essentially, uh, we believe the end goal is to be proactive rather than reactive. It has become critical as ever to be more agile, quickly respond to the changing dam demands, etc. Uh, Eric, question to you. Now, with with a lot of things playing in, like say, agile DevSecOps, uh, productivity, new talent models, which we've talked about, this raises a lot of debates. What are the new debates that you anticipate uh, and and watch out for? Yes, yeah, so I think there. I think there's already. A has been a debate in the past around, you know, does agile have to mean everybody in the same room or can you do it um, distributed? Um, what I think this will force is getting a lot more precision on what allows that sort of dynamic and collab collaboration. You know, is it sort of like the culture and knowing each other? Is it the um, way in which you communicate and kind of being near instant availability or instant? Is it the way people get developed and be more um, cross-functional. And so what are really the things that allow uh, some of these models to work? And then if you were to try to overcome those things in a virtual way, what is, you know, what what are the options? Um, I think uh, people have sort of relied on truisms, um, but it will cause people have to peel several more layers of the onion to uh, get smart about what are you really trying to capture to, to generate those sort of results. Fair enough. Thanks, Eric. Uh, over to Anurag for, for covering the next set of provocations. Thanks, Parul. Thanks, Eric. Um, so the number three provocation is essentially we're saying uh, as enterprises refocus demand, they will also need to recalibrate the entire workforce strategy, in particular the talent supply part of it. And winning firms will essentially adopt a design principles workforce strategy. So what does that mean? Uh, the key key levers of a design principles led approach is essentially that this is intentional and reiterative right so if you look at the, the the chart right so number one essentially start with defining your distinct demand segments this could be business units functions geographies then you essentially forecast the demand in view of various business objectives and scenarios this, so this could be things like how does uh, different how do different paces of automation or technology adoption change your demand uh, plus also you know in, you build in your existing or known gaps into that so you sort of forecast your demand for a few years out second you look at various supply scenarios and design constructs so you play around with how you mix your shoring portfolio sourcing mix service providers and locations and you sort of uh, then forecast your talent supply both from an internal meaning what you will grow from your own base current base but also what you may be able to tap into from the market uh, and then you build in some scenarios around market growth and how can you implement upscaling or training programs uh, number three you basically then start to compare these supply profiles with each other not just on the ability to fulfill demand but also things around cost of operations cost of actually getting into that uh, supply profile or the transformation to that supply profile things around ease of management and how much safety does it offer against risks so not just the financial but also non-financial impact 
finally uh, on number four then you start to prioritize the best fit supply profiles so nail down which which uh, you know construct will actually suit you best and then that also feeds back into what are the key interventions you need to make in terms of whether you need to uh, ramp up on upskilling you need to change your training programs uh, or retention programs uh, I, do you need to access new sources of talent or do you need to tap into new locations or rationalize your portfolio of locations or service providers and then finally on on five you start to then uh, establish workforce strategy design per the winning profile so you look at shoring mix and locations these are on the left you look at sourcing models you look at sources of talent for each of these uh, components and each of the sub components you start to then lay down blueprint on what is the number of these models you want to tap into what is the size and share of each in your portfolio what is the role they are playing in the portfolio so are they the champion for um, are they a champion or a challenger for a particular function are they default for a function versus are they going to be used selectively to drive innovation so you lay down roles and then also uh, be more intentional about how you place work in these models to create more redundancy and other and address other objectives now the the thing around reiterative is that you don't stop here you let this feed into uh, into a reiteration of your demand and then a recalibration of your supply portfolio so this is sort of a continuous process that we believe that best of breed firms repeat practically every year on some basis but a full overhaul maybe once in three five years Okay. Next page, please. Um, finally, on the provocation number four, uh, we believe that uh, while there will be uh, changes in the forces that drive location strategy, some of these changes will also drive what roles they are able to play in, in your portfolios. Uh, so let's get to the next page. Uh, we have laid down some factors that drive location strategy on the left, uh, and e and the impact of each of these factors on uh, different uh, shores so we're talking about offshore nearshore onshore separately so as you can see rising cost pressures will push more uh, activity offshore whereas more automation will actually mean um, that some of the voluminous transactional work gets automated from offshore uh, and so on so BCP resilience will drive some more work offshore as companies diversify their footprints uh, work from home models will actually be implemented offshore but they will not drive growth in offshore but they will be actually uh, used to sweeten business case for retaining work onshore so that's why onshore is a green for uh, higher adoption of flexible working models uh, we also see that there will be some return of the protectionist sentiments as unemployment becomes bigger in the key source markets so that will lead to some growth being concentrated in onshore markets overall if you if you were to look at a summary outlook from a short term perspective we believe that there will be slowdown in demand for talent or demand for uh, new centers uh, across geographies uh, essentially because there is uh, a budget cliff and a you know uh, overall lower demand coming from enterprises there's a reduction in discretionary spends and there's a lot of pro focus on process re-engineering to remove um, you know work from a longer term outlook we believe that a uh, combination of strong cost pressures and evolving and maturing talent will bring growth back to offshore we believe that nearshore locations are stand to gain a fair bit given that there is a focus on bcp uh, you know they also fulfill a need for access to diverse and complex skills uh, and desire for proximity with business and clients and then finally i think on the onshore locations we believe that there will be selective growth as we pointed out earlier especially in considering tier two or tier three kind of options um, as enterprises start to uh, desire more control and more proximity with business and clients we believe like I mentioned earlier that um, work from home will actually be a key lever for growth uh, happening onshore uh, with that we are done with our uh, provocations uh, I'll hand it back over to Eric Okay, great. Um, one last poll that we wanted to run by and see what most on people's mind is the, the BCP topic. So it's if you had to choose one thing that you think will be most important for your organization as it um, relooks at BCP, um, you know, what would that be? So either how work is actually placed, so maybe not what you're using, but how you're using it, 
um, might actually be adding options, um, either more sourcing models, uh, more locations, or potentially um, reducing the concentration, maybe overexposed to single centers or geographies. Uh, might be increased training or um, cross-training so that people can uh, work in more areas and more um, flexibility of deploying the talent. Um, or might it be the technology? Um, hey, we really need to be more more virtual, um, less people dependent, less location dependent. Or maybe it's none of them. We don't really expect any notable actions um, that we think the BCP held up nicely and there's no, no new thing. Okay, so let's go ahead and wrap up uh, the poll. Aha, um, the answer is technology. Um, and I think this goes to, you know, one of the, the memes that's been going around the internet that you know COVID proved to be a better digital transformation change agent than the uh, chief digital officer. Um, that people now see the the limits of what they had achieved and um, want to push further. Great. Um, we'll go now to just wrap up a few things we think will be controversies that um, there's not clear answers on yet. Um, and this list could be very long. We've chosen just three here. Uh, the first is as people are sorting through what worked or didn't work um, and are thinking about sourcing models, will the basis of how they choose the sourcing models change? Is their evaluation criteria going to change in terms of pros and cons? Uh, might that be related to um, work from home? Might it be BCP capabilities? You know, will, will they actually make decisions based off of different factors? Second, um, we've mentioned work from home a lot, and we've also had some questions um, throughout this around, you know, hey, are some of these high levels of work from home um, realistic? Um, from a controversy perspective, um, you know, is this love at first sight going to fade a bit? Um, uh, I think we believe, you know, some of these percentages are, are too high in reality. There are some offsetting factors, um, but that's yet to be seen. And then, you know, what is what does all this really mean on how you design the workplace? When people come to the office, will they expect a different sort of office? How many people will be more permanent office dwellers versus more occasional? Um, and this falls into a lot of corporate real estate things that um, there's not clear answers on yet. Um, we've talked to clients that both assume they're going to have much less real estate. We've actually talked to others who feel they're actually going to end up with more real estate because they won't build a packet as densely. Um, and then finally, um, as we think about what more we can do with uh, technology at, um, on uh, how work actually gets done, how you manage it, um, how you can maybe um, enable uh, AI to assist people in getting work done, how do you maybe help people network when they're not when they're more virtual? You know, what were these second or second order implications as technology becomes more deeply embedded in the ways we work? And then uh, finally on slide 27 before I hand to um, Perul, um, we've included a kind of a simple little worksheet on is we think as organizations are thinking about all the things they could do. And as we've uh, sort of uh, suggested, everything in some ways is on the table at this point, which is daunting. Uh, we think it's important to uh, figure out you know, where are you currently on a number of key dimensions and then where do you really want to get to? What's your desired level? From that, it becomes a bit easier to prioritize, uh, you know, which things um, should be first and are there interconnections between some of these in terms of how you would uh, orient the initiatives. Um, Pearl, over to you to wrap us up. Thank you, Eric. Uh, moving to the next page. Yeah. Uh, so talent and locations is one of the things we have deep expertise on. We track about 300 odd locations on a regular basis, covering breadth and depth of global services. So we have an offer for the participants in the webinar today that if you'd like to give us a test run here, this is a complimentary offer, what we call as locations data check. Uh, essentially, you can select two locations from a standard set of 20 locations. Uh, you'll see some interesting names here. These include emerging or next wave locations, so the likes of a, a Kenya, Nigeria, Jamaica, and then tier two, three locations in established kind of countries. So, for instance, in Iloilo in Philippines, uh, a Campinas in Brazil, Jaipur in India, etc. All you need to do is basically select two locations for comparison, uh, one location for baselining and then select the function that is of high interest. So between IT applications, development, maintenance, and FNA, uh, what you will receive is an out output to the short pack analysis across key dimensions that impact the relative attractiveness of a location. 
So essentially parameters around uh, the size of entry level talent pool. Uh, how does the ex market landscape look like? What are the key players? Uh, how do how does the cost stand or, or is the location feasible from a financial standpoint? And then uh, how does the operating risk, including the impact of COVID, how does that profile span out? So uh, you can get access to this data by either sending us an email or responding to the post webinar survey. Uh, with that, let's move to the Q&A session. I see pages and pages of questions here. Uh, I'm just reading the list of questions. Uh, throwing the first one uh, uh, to Eric here. Eric, uh, with, there's a question around, uh, with, with work from home going to be new normal, do you think concerns around data security, privacy will now take a back seat? Right. Thanks, Pearl. Ironically, I just typed an answer into that one. Um, short answer is uh, no. Um, people are still going to um, be concerned about this, and rightfully so. And uh, as people get more used to that type of model in certain situations, um, secondary concerns will creep up on how things could be misused. Um, I think what we can expect is that in some cases, people will be a bit more lenient. So, for example, a number of companies we've spoken to said, you know, we realized at the end of the day, we were holding our third parties to a different standard than our own employees, and we couldn't necessarily fundamentally justify that. So, as a part of this, we've allowed whatever our employees were doing for our third parties to also do. Um, things like that may stick around or with some, some, some minor tweaks. I think um, we also won't have everybody work from home. That won't be the default for everyone. Um, and so it, so some of the need to solve it will also diminish a bit. Um, and then we also, I think we'll see a lot of innovation and technologies to help um, deal with some of these uh, uh, concerns to maybe um, predict what may have happened or could happen to monitor, et cetera. That'll raise employee privacy concerns, not necessarily just customer but the kind of digital instrumentation of how people are working and how you're, how the companies are responsible for monitoring that will force some um, both innovation, but also some um, uh, uncomfortable uh, uh, trade-offs. Very well. Thanks, Eric. Uh, the next question we have is around, uh, Anurag, I will kind of pass it on to you for this one. So do you have any observations for firms with a COE model in a specific location? Do you think there may be rethinking of how the COE model is looked at at an industry level? Um, so I think um, in, a, in a lot of ways, this, this crisis has um, exposed a lot of these flaws in workforce strategy, right? So not that these flaws didn't exist before, it's just that because of the global and unprecedented black swan kind of an event, uh, a lot of these uh, lack of redundancies and and you know fallacies and false beliefs have been thrown out in the open. Um, we do expect a lot of change in and transformation in locations portfolios, largely because um, because people, companies will try to become more safe and you know be better at managing BCP. Uh, but also there are other factors at play which were in many ways active even before this crisis right so uh, increasing talent congestion in specific skills um, while there are uh, you know because of the crisis there are some markets that will see probably some reduced congestion at the same time you know when you look at your location strategy companies will still need to orchestrate their hubs and spokes and centers of excellence uh, with a very well-defined and intentional roles. So we don't believe that the the framework of having a center of excellence model in built into the location strategy will change, but we believe that what you will end up calling a COE in the future may actually change. There may be cases where you are actually, um, you know, you have smaller sized centers that are focusing on on, on more niche skills. Uh, you may have a scenario where what we are calling office pods, which are you know small sized, maybe less than 10 FT kind of centers that are remoted, sorry, located remotely from your main office, where you are concentrating some kind of skills in a particular region. Uh, so these may be called centers of excellence, uh, or it may be actually divided more by um, the kind of business unit or a, or a geo 
or uh, just a you know region you're serving so net net uh, we do believe that there will be lots of change and transformation in locations but fundamentally the coe model may not uh, may not cease to exist although the meaning of that may change okay interesting thanks anurag uh, with that i'm cognizant of the time and we'll answer the remaining questions offline uh moving to slide 31 uh yeah so essentially we we do encourage all of you to take a moment and visit our covid 19 resource center on everestgrp.com slash covid 19 or you can navigate via our home page of our website uh we have lots of information based on interviews podcast briefings etc and many other resources which may help you on the journey uh with that a big thanks to all of you who've joined us today, and I'll hand it over to Peter. Thank you to Parul, Anurag, and Eric, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Again, you will receive a follow-up email within one to two business days with a link to download the presentation slides, along with accessing the on-demand playback. On behalf of Everest Group and our presenters, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.